Late every Saturday night in the South, something magical happens. In the wee hours, in the between time. The last of the tipsy stragglers who have danced and flirted and partied almost all night long are just making it home. And only an hour or two later, the folks who went to bed early so they could make it to church on time are just waking up. It's that hour when the Saturday night profane is giving way to the Sunday morning sacred. Two kinds of people, one who wants to rejoice in their body, one who wants to rejoice in their soul. Except we all know that life never breaks down into neat little categories like that, the party people and the worshipful people. Most of us, truth be told, are both. We are sometimes raucous, sometimes prayerful, sometimes earthly and sometimes heavenly, sometimes sacred and other times profane. Me, I think that's okay. I think that's just dandy. Because those magical moments as Saturday night bleeds over into Sunday morning have produced some of the greatest cultural treasures the American South has ever given to the world. And today on Salvation South Deluxe, we're going to chat with somebody who created some of the exact treasures that I'm talking about, and we'll hear him tell us how his journey to musical stardom started on the Sunday morning side of that line. I'm Chuck Reese, and welcome to Salvation South Deluxe, a series of in-depth pieces that we're adding to our podcast feed that unravel the untold stories of the Southern experience, narrated by the authentic voices that make this region truly unique. a song from 1967 called Every Day Will Be Like a Holiday. It was written and sung by William Bell. William was the first male solo artist ever signed to Stax Records. Stax Records on Macklemore Avenue in Memphis, Tennessee is a very important site in the cultural history of the American South. It was one of the three primary birthplaces of a musical genre that came to be known as soul. The other two, which we will address in later editions of Salvation South Deluxe, are Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and Macon, right here in Georgia. Six years before Every Day Will Be Like a Holiday hit the radio airwaves in 67, a young man just 21 years old named William Yarbrough walked into Stax and signed that record contract. He took the stage name William Bell, B-E-L-L, to honor his grandmother, whose name was Belle, B-E-L-L-E. And he distinguished himself not only as a performer, but as a songwriter. No discussion about the Southern soul music of the 1960s is complete without William Bell. He wrote hits for himself, like that one, and for many other great artists, like Albert King. And Otis Redding. You don't miss no water till you will run dry. When William signed that first contract with Stax, he could not have understood the magnitude of what he was walking into. He was about to become part of the creation story of soul music, one of the greatest achievements in the history of Southern culture. At the time, in 1961, that phrase, soul music, was just coming into the American vernacular. The earliest documented use of the term is a 1961 reference in the Los Angeles Sentinel. That black newspaper, in an article about Georgia-born Ray Charles, called him, and I quote, a soul music genius. 
The term soul arose because many black musicians whose work was crossing over to appeal to young white people had their musical roots in the black churches in which they had been raised. Now let's pause for a second to think about that word, soul. Why, the idea itself is the province of the church. I mean, here's a line from the book of Deuteronomy. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now, artists like Ray Charles, starting in the late 1950s, were turning the rhythms and vocal styles and even the language of gospel music toward the concerns of Saturday night. Speaking of church, that Ray Charles tune was the very first single ever to hit the Billboard pop charts with the word hallelujah in its title. It makes sense because Aretha Robinson, the mother of Ray Charles Robinson, made sure that her son sang in the church choir. And like young Ray Charles in Georgia, William Bell was raised in the church in Memphis. Absolutely. Same story. I started in church around seven, singing with the choir there in church with my mom. My mom was in the choir. And uh, around nine, I kind of graduated out singing solo with the choir behind me. But uh, I did start in the the Baptist church there in Memphis. (laughs) In the 40s and 50s, there was a whole lot of pretty amazing gospel quartet music around that time, you know, like the, the Soul Stirrers and the and Dixie the Hummingbirds. And the Sw- Boy, yeah, and Dixie Hummingbirds, yes. all those guys, yeah. You were listening to those people, too. Absolutely. My favorite was Sam Cooke and the Soul Stirrers, though. Uh, even to this day, they had just intricate harmonies, and Sam had a way of telling a story with the lyrical content and, and ad-libbing on it and and just had a a wonderful tone to his voice. So the Soul Stirrers were my favorite group. Sam Cooke, who was born in 1931 in Clarksdale, Mississippi, joined the Soul Stirrers as their lead singer when he was only 19 years old in 1950. The Soul Stirrers had already been around for nearly 25 years, but after Cooke's unforgettable voice took the lead, the group soared to new heights of popularity. Jesus gave me water, and it was not in the well. There was a woman from Samaria came to the well to get some water. But seven years later, in 1957, Sam Cooke made a decision that made a lot of churchgoers angry. He decided to leave gospel music and go pop. And you know, hey, we all know his first hit. Darling, you. So here we are in 1957, and William Bell, now only 18 years old, has just watched his gospel music hero, Sam Cooke, step over onto the pop charts. And William was already on his way to making the same move. He had already formed a little doo-wop singing group called the Del Rios. William spent a lot of time in those days hanging out with a young white musician named Chips Moman, who would later go on to an amazing career of his own as a producer and songwriter. The pair liked to hang out at Memphis Recording Service, a studio founded in 1950 by a man named Sam Phillips. Sam's place became famous in 1953 when another young Memphis man, Elvis Presley, made his first recordings there for Sam's label, Sun Records. I knew Chip's moment, and I would hang out sometime at uh, Sam Phillips' studio at Sun. We knew Elvis. Elvis used to come down to the Flamingo Room and sit in the back while we were singing and watch us perform. But we all knew each other. George Klein, who was Elvis's buddy, introduced us. And and George and I were good friends from since I was a teenager. We did his uh, Christmas shows (laughs) on, on television for him. So we all were just mixed up there, Jerry Lee. Um, and like I said, Ronnie Millsap was there at the time, and Dickie Lee, and just a host of other acts coming up. So think about this. 
Here is a young black musician in 1961, three years before the passage of the Civil Rights Act, Jim Crow laws in full force. But inside Sam Phillips' son studios, the color line didn't matter. Sun Records didn't care. I, you know, they didn't. All we cared about was what you brought into that studio in terms of creativity. If you could write, right. you could sing, or you could play, whatever the situation was, we wanted you to do the best that you could. And we just got together inside those confines of the studio, whether it was Sun or Stax, and had a great time. White guys like Chips Moman and Elvis Presley. Black guys like William Bell and Booker T. Jones, who co-wrote Every Day Will Be Like a Holiday with William. They just wanted to make great music together. They had that in common. And they had something else in common. They had all grown up singing in church and listening to gospel quartet music on the radio. While William was into black groups like Sam Cooke and the Soul Stirrers and the Fairfield Four, Elvis was listening to white groups like Georgia's Hovey Lister and the Statesman or Mississippi's Blackwood Brothers. You know, it's funny. I grew up hearing the quartet music, uh, but mostly, like, you know, because we were kept apart back in those days. Uh, right. You know, I I was listening to Hovey Lister and the Statesman and the Blackwood Brothers and and oh, people yeah. like that. Yeah, we you know, did too. Uh, <laughs> You know, I learned after growing up in that because my dad sang bass in quartets for in several different ones. And when I got a little older, I learned we were singing a lot of the same songs. We just Absolutely. weren't doing it together. Absolutely. Uh, and then and the, the proof of the pudding to that is Elvis. Elvis used the statesman and different people behind him for a while. We understood where they were coming from because most of the black acts at that time and the white acts were right out of church. And uh, right. that's why that's why we got out of the cut out our uh our tenure and everything our IT is in church. And it was good training for lyrical contents and making a feel of a uh, a story and the lyric and continuity and all that stuff. It was just great training. In those songs was, I guess you would have to call it sort of a, a feeling of transcendence. Like, you know, you think about a song like Precious Lord, Take My Hand, right. for instance. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. So much feeling in that song and i guess it just makes sense that that when you take people who grew up on stuff like that and put them in a studio to make you know secular music the same kind of feelings going to bleed over absolutely and you, you know the same people that worked hard all week and went to out to party on Saturday night and let their hair down. They were in church on Sunday morning, those same people. <laughs> and so when the music, uh, secular music came into, in, into play, it was from the gospel singers. It just made sense. And that, that's black and white, you know. And, and uh, it just made sense that... Um, because we were singing to the same people, just in a different venue with a different lyrical content, but with that same musical approach. Uh, I guess that's why they call it soul music, because uh, you sang at any given time what you were feeling at the moment, so to tell that story. You talk about, you guess that's why they call it soul music. I mean, was that term even in usage when you first started working at Stax in the late 50s and early 60s? No, it was either rockabilly it was for the white act. They were country music, rockabilly, and the black music was jazz, blues, rhythm and blues. When you put a beat to it and they could dance to it. Uh, 
<laughs> but uh, yeah. it was the same music from the same people, the guys out of Mississippi and Louisiana, uh, New Orleans and places. The same music, they were all out of church. Most of the artists, their parents were either preachers or, or deacons or something in the church, and they were in church on Sunday morning. But to, to make some money, make some extra money, including BB, he would he would he would go out on the street and sing, and they he made more money in his hat. He was telling he made right. more money in his hat than he was making, you know, trying to do gospel music. So he figured out, well, okay, I can sing blues. It's just changing the lyrics. A lot of the original early blues stuff came out of the church music. I mean, Sam Cooke, yeah, you know, yeah. he was, his stuff was just original. That's why the church people were so angry with him, because he was taking gospel music, changing the lyrics to it, and but with the same melody, and, and making hits out of it. Talking specifically about Sam Cooke, I think there's a good argument to be made that a change is going to come could be read as a gospel song, too. I go to the movie and I go downtown. Somebody keep telling me, don't hang around. It's been a long Absolutely. And I think he kind of meant that because he had listened to Bob Dylan's Blowing in the Wind. And he was, <laughs> he always felt he should have more significant like that, like Blowing in the Wind. And yeah. so he created a change is going to come. And to me, when you listen to that, that's a reference to. His ex how he expressed it, how he felt it, and the lyrical content, too. So it could very well be what we call pseudo-gospel. Right. It, it, it is, because it, it's got that feeling, and it's it's uplifting. It, yes. It, it's, it, it, it makes you feel like things can get better. Right. right? And there's always hope. One of the most amazing things, though, to me, is how persistently popular the music that y'all were making back in those days in Memphis just continued to be. It's like generation after generation grew up dancing to it. Because human, the, the, the people are people, and that's the world over. Uh, the human nature of people... The times change, uh, the, the living conditions might change, but the human factor on how you deal with living remains the same. And so people can relate to something if there's re real, if you're real about it and you're telling the truth about uh, how it feels to be left alone by your loved one or how it feels to be discriminated against or whatever the situation is, if you feel that you do an honest job of that, no matter what generation you are, and when you start communicating with other individuals, uh, that same feeling is going to creep in. And that's in every country, and I've traveled extensively, and Sometimes in countries that people don't even understand the English language, they feel what you're portraying and what you're trying to project in the way you sing a lyric. Just right. the same as we do when we listen to opera sometimes. I listen to Madame Butterfly or something. And I don't understand. I understand what I call survival Italia, but I don't understand uh, fluent Italian. But right. I can listen to an opera, and I understand it because of the emotional value of it. That's the same thing that people do in every generation, in every race, creed, or cult. We all have the same wishes, frustration, desires, or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
right there. There it is. We all have the same wishes and frustrations and desires, regardless of what we believe or the color of our skin. And I think what William is telling us is that when people reach down inside themselves, really try to dig in and try to express what they feel and what they desire from the very core of their being, then they can make music that shakes us. Music that can rightfully be called the music of the soul. As we were putting this episode together, there was an odd coincidence. I was doing a crossword puzzle, and there were two parallel clues. One was the inner self in psychology. The other was the inner self in religion. The answer to the psychology clue was ego. The answer to the religion clue was soul. And there, in that liminal space, in the wee hours between Saturday night and Sunday morning, when we sit right on the dividing line between the ego and the soul, between the innermost desires of our bodies and the innermost desires of our souls. Six decades ago in the American South, black artists and white artists together created music of the soul, and they chose to call it soul music because it expressed our whole selves, the Saturday night side and the Sunday morning side. And one of those people was William Bell. Since 1969, William has lived in the fair city of Atlanta, not far from where we recorded this episode. And today, 63 years after he signed that contract with Stax Records, his career as a professional singer, songwriter, and producer is still going strong. William's most recent album, One Day Closer to Home, came out last year. You should buy a copy. It is filled, to use the word of the day, with soul. You're never too old to say how you feel. We'd like to thank Mr. William Bell for his time and consideration. You've been listening to Salvation South Deluxe proudly produced in cooperation with Georgia Public Broadcasting and its network of 20 stations around our state. Every Friday, we add a new three-minute commentary about Southern stuff to our podcast feed, and we periodically add longer deluxe stories, such as the one we just told you. I'm Chuck Reese, your host and the editor-in-chief of Salvation South, which you can find 24-7 at SalvationSouth.com. Our producer is the mighty Jake Cook, who also composed our theme music. GPB senior podcast producer is Jeremy Powell. And none of this could have happened without wonderful people like GPB's Sandy Malcolm, Ellen Reinhardt, and Adam Woodleaf. We'll be back next month with another full-length episode of the Salvation South Deluxe podcast. <laughs>